Hey folks, this is Terry. We're here with the local and offline collaboration call of IPFS. Um, not, a, not a super strict agenda this week, but here to chat about whatever is on people's minds in this space. So I threw a couple of um, links in our agenda to articles that come to mind. These are all from the offline camp medium publication. So one that was just posted yesterday is from RJ Steiner and it's about tangerine. And they, um, they basically replaced a process in, I think in Africa. So it's data collection for surveys from an educational scenario. And there were literal like truckloads of paper surveys being dealt with originally. And they used CouchDB and PouchDB, which are more traditional offline first tools to transform that. But at the end of the article, he mentions that this, works really well up to a point, like collecting collecting data offline and then when you have a connection, syncing it up so that everybody can see the same data is what most offline first apps do and tools like CouchDB and PouchDB are built to do. But when they have people in the same school as each other on the ground trying to get everyone set up with the technology to start with is problematic and that's where a decentralized tool where I could get my get my version of the app installed from Lytle's version, who's sitting next to me, instead of from a network connection. Um, so he kind of highlights that gap, like so much you can do with traditional offline first solutions, but there are little pieces where the decentralized web approach would be more helpful. Um, so that's one in kind of the data collection vein. Certainly medical data collection is hugely important here too. Um, so the article that's up above on fighting Ebola with JavaScript, this is also a CouchDB and PouchDB one. I'm not sure that there's a decentralized angle to that, but I, a lot of the people who have come to offline camp have used CouchDB and PouchDB um, when they were fighting the Ebola crisis. So certainly having health professionals able to quickly see data from cases in other places is really important. Um, but you can't guess why I'm thinking about that right now. Um, and then there's an article there about the response to there was some severe flooding in India. So this one does focus more on some decentralized solutions to communications. I think maybe um, there's various like peer-to-peer -peer and mesh networking solutions that people have used to kind of replace cell phone service or how whatever other messaging platforms they would they would normally use to let each other know they're safe because even if there is cell phone service, it might get completely overwhelmed during an emergency when everyone's trying to use it. Um, and then the other thing is just like huge data sets for research, for example, which I could see also relating to the medical field. So uh, Max Ogden, who is one of the creators of DAT, um, is in this podcast episode that we that we recorded at Offline Camp talking about how how data is structured specifically in a way that is good for those scientific data sets um, and keeping them online in a place where you know research communities might not have the the, <laughs> the money or the whatever resources they need to keep everything up to date but you have to like to verify other people's work my understanding is you need the original underlying data you have to have access to it to verify it so um, those are just a few ideas that I threw in there um, some things that seem a little bit relevant right now. And there are other things. If you go to the offline camp medium publication, there's a tab specifically about decentralized web stuff where you can find more on mesh networking and things like that. There's one on developing worlds that also tends to have a lot of the um, interesting articles about um, you know, medical response, et cetera. Hospital Run is another app that's really cool in the medical front. So um, those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. I don't know, Lytle, I don't know if you have like within the IPFS scope, if you've seen um, things being used for like medical data collection or disaster response or any of that. I think we got a very good person to talk about this today. Yeah, it's oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, so I'm from the medical imaging space, been doing that oh, for cool. 20 years. Yeah, and so I know a lot about healthcare data and specifically medical imaging, but I just met um, Marcin at the last meeting. That comes your name correct, Marcin, or do you per go by your handle? Well, I don't, it's much easier for everyone. <laughs> uh, okay. 
yeah, so I just met him for the first time at the um, the desktop uh, meeting prior to this one. But yeah, you know, I, I've been in medical imaging 20 years and um, left my position as CTO uh, back in December to kind of find the next thing and kind of stumble upon IPFS. I think when it comes to medical imaging, taking a content addressable uh, model, um, it solves actually every problem we have, and there's a lot of problems we have within medical imaging. I think one of the interesting things is that medical data is inherently immutable. Uh, you really don't want to destroy anything that you, you capture. And in fact, from a medical legal point of view, you often need to, you're required to keep track of it. For example, medical images, you, you need to keep it in the US, you need to keep track of them for eight years at a minimum. If it's an oncology patient or a pediatric patient, you need to keep it for life of the patient. So the data really lasts a long time. And um, there, it's also quite large, at least medical imaging is. I think a lot of the other healthcare data um, that, you know, isn't as big. Uh, but uh, uh, within medical imaging, it's huge benefits if we can avoid, take advantage of the deduplication capabilities in um, things. So, uh, so yeah, I know a lot about it. I'd be happy to share with anyone. And I've been personally working on a project to take uh, medical images and store them in IPFS. Actually, I have an IPLD data model I'm building um, and then storing an IPFS and be able to import data, export it back out in the standard format and view it using a web browser using um, uh, JS IPFS. So doing a lot of cool stuff there. But when it comes to offline, since I know that this is the, the meeting here, um, you know, because healthcare data is intrinsically immutable, it does make sense to be able to collect it on a local device and even cache it is probably an, another important thing. Um, having the most recent version of something is obviously always ideal, but um, you know, I'd say the kind of the rate at which the data changes is fairly slow. And so even having access to something that's a little bit old, a few seconds, minutes, or even days can be hugely helpful um, you know, to uh, delivering patient care. And of course, the peer-to-peer uh, -peer aspect of this is also really, really valuable because um, uh, especially in rural you know, uh, communities, uh, third world countries, just may not have the infrastructure. And so being able to continue to operate and having some data is better than no data. So I think there's a lot of interesting things specifically to healthcare. And of yeah. course, our current crisis, um, you know, is something to, you know, I think this is kind of like a, good time to take this technology and move it forward quickly to, right. to help. Yeah, that's really cool. Do you have, is the project that you're working on now in a spot that's public, like a repo people could check out if they're interested? Are there any links we should throw in the notes there? It's fine uh, no, if it's, it's not, just asking. It's not, my goal is okay. to actually make it all open source, but um, uh, it's currently private. As I'm trying okay. to, maybe I'm just trying to figure out how to do this right. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, that sounds like a really neat project. Um, Lytle, tell us about this link you added or anything you wanna talk about. Web NFC for mobile, near field communication, right? It's fresh from the other call. So I basically, I'm a conduit for sharing links. Yes. Someone else sent to me 30 minutes ago. So uh, maybe easier uh, th yeah, this great. way. Yeah, so like uh, Chrome uh, 81 shipped uh, an origin trial of this, I believe. So origin trial is basically like uh, like an alpha beta preview. It's okay. behind always like uh, behind sort of like a flag. You need to either register and your website needs to send additional header with a token. So the browser knows that you are fine with enabling this experimental technology on your website or as a user, you're fine with enabling it globally. It depends, depending on the, the new web uh, APIs that they add or experiment with. In this particular case, it's WebNFC. Uh, I did not like actually read the entire article because I jump, just jumped uh, into this call, but why it's interesting for offline uh, uh, and local? Well, you may have uh, two phones without any connection to each other. There may be no internet, no mobile reception. You know that both of you are using IPFS or lp 2 p nodes in your apps or you have it installed on, on the system. But still, how do you like 
connect to each other. You, you both can like enable Bluetooth, but still you don't know peer ID. Peer ID is that this like long string of uh, characters. Uh, so this could be uh, a way for uh, uh, LP2P signaling without any like centralized service. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been thinking about maybe web Bluetooth being the transport or like uh, Wi-Fi direct, like setting a ad hoc hotspot for a situation when you want to like connect to each other directly. Uh, in, in those situations still, there's, uh, there remains a problem of uh, discovery. Uh, we, we may have the transport, we may have means of connecting to each other, but unless we know the address, uh, and the identity of the other person, we are not able to do that in a secure way. This is something that could, uh, I'm not sure if it would like unlock entire transport, but I feel it could at least uh, serve as uh, an option for signaling. So uh, one app or one phone could expose a manifest with its own addresses, including local ones, maybe a locally spawned hotspot, uh, if uh, nothing else is available. And the other person would uh, simply like scan that phone uh, and be able to, with significant uh, degree of confidence, to connect to that specific node and, uh, and get uh, bootstrapped from there. So, it's still unclear, uh, probably requires uh, going through the API similar, uh, in similar fashion as we did for web, uh, for web Bluetooth, but uh, it's really exciting that this capability could be available on regular websites at some point. Uh, this means uh, progressive web apps, which are designed to work in offline mode, could also support uh, this like ad hoc pairing or discovery uh, between uh, people. Uh, it will, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, people will come up with very exciting ideas uh, for the, the, like the easiest ones are, are like multiplayer games when you want to quickly pair or when you want to like quickly share, share each other's like details uh, somehow. Uh, but I'm really excited about this, like distributed, decentralized. That's that's probably the most important part. That it's like a way of doing the decentralized signaling uh, on mobile with just a web browser. So that's why I added it to the list, mostly to put it out there. Uh, it's just like early origin trial, and it's unclear what what's fully possible with those APIs. But uh, it's pretty encouraging that. Uh, pretty encouraging fact that it will uh, at some point land in Chromium and like Chromium has over 80% of market. So the moment that lands, uh, most of people will be able to use it, uh, especially on, mo on mobile, right? Nice. I just completely spaced out on taking notes, so feel free to add. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Um, neat. Yeah, what else do people want to chat about? What's on your minds in the offline space? Other stuff we've seen in IPFS land that's interesting for local collaboration or things we're seeing people able to do in general for local collaboration that we can't yet do in IPFS and why not? What would we have to change to make it work? Mm, I have a sort of related thing for an mm -hmm. offline. Uh, so uh, a lot of people are using IPFS for website hosting and they set up DNS link. So, uh, so they set up DNS link and basically the DNS uh, name points at some HTTP server. That HTTP server happens to be uh, IPFS gateway. And that way they get a pretty nice uh, host name in the location bar. So for example, if you go to uh, English Wikipedia mirror, uh, 
you can load it as a like a regular website mm -hmm. you can also load it from a http gateway the fact is it's the same gateway it's the same server it's just like the way it's represented in the location bar so the ongoing problem was uh it's nice i can load it from a some http server which is somewhere but the moment i load it from my local node it's no longer like this pretty domain in front of url it looks more like this it's like my local my local ip right and then ipns and then there's this net domain name someone picked um or peer id uh, which if you don't want to rely on dns so what will land in the next version of Go IPFS is something we call subdomain gateways. Uh, there are subdomain gateways uh, right now, uh, but those are using custom configuration uh, at the Nginx level. Now we will uh, support uh, gateway, subdomain gateways and HTTP proxy mode directly in Go IPFS. And what that means uh, there will be a blog post, but for now and specifically for this uh, for this call is the way DNS link websites are handled by, by IPFS companion browser extension are a bit tricky. We redirect them to local uh, IPFS node, so they work in offline mode. However, you lose this security isolation right now uh, and people are not able to use more advanced uh, AP, web APIs because they are aware, hopefully, uh, that uh, there's a single sandbox for all websites loaded that way. And what will change, it will be that uh, with this next release, we will be able to do uh, something like this. So the original name or content identifier or peer ID will be here and then there will be IPNS or IPFS subdomain on the local host. So it's a bit better for user experience. You get the, like the name of the content route you are actually interested in upfront. Uh, and from that, uh, this entire uh, host name uh, will build an origin isolation per content route. So each website will be isolated. And having that, we will be able to like redirect all websites which have DNS link to local node without decreasing security isolation. Uh, and that hopefully will make uh, those uh, DNS link websites much more useful in offline environments. Because right now, if people are using uh, a website which is backed by DNS link and they uh, want to do something uh, more than just like read text, they usually need to disable that redirect uh, so that, that they don't get a different uh, security uh, guarantees, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I believe that will be a pretty, pr pretty cool. Uh, long story short, we will increase the surface uh, of uh, cases when we can load content locally from my local node instead of fetching it from arbitrary servers on the internet, which is like the plus uh, added value for offline use cases. Hmm. Nice. There will hmm. be a blog post, I promise. Yeah, <laughs> which, will, I took, which will explain it in much better Explain it all, way. yeah. Feel free to edit my notes on that section, which I'm sure a little gobbledygook. Cool. What else? We can either chat about stuff now that people are thinking about, or if there's something you'd really like to hear about on a future call, a use case, or a company you've heard about that we should try to get a speaker from. We could do some pre-planning. We've been sort of uh, discussing um, website publishing and content delivery networks with people from terminal terminal.co mm -hmm. and uh, I, I know they're in super early stage but some uh, spaces they are exploring are distributed content like distributed cdns uh, which 
sort of like leverage, uh, let's say they leverage uh, JS IPFS running in the browser, uh, like a swarm of such nodes uh, running in the browser instead of so, uh, something like Cloudflare where, or other CDN provider, which it's still like, it's decentral, it's like federated within that organization, but it's still under the control of a single entity, which decides which content is blocked or not. Um, I, I probably too, too, too soon right now, but at some point uh, it would be super useful to invite them uh, to this call. Uh, I believe they were recently on IPFS All Hands call uh, and they gave a demo of uh, uh, integration with GitHub. So just like you've got the GitHub pages, you simply push uh, your website and it gets published. Um, uh, they showed a version which is super slick and uh, is publishing to IPFS with DNS link, so that uh, it's, like connects nicely to uh, what I mentioned before. Uh, by default, the, the, there's like a D DNS link, and if someone has IPFS companion and node, it will upgrade people to uh, uh, to that version. Um, nothing else comes to mind, I'm afraid. Okay. Chris, how about you? Anything in the local offline collaboration space that you wish you knew more about or would like to chat more about? Hmm. I don't have a specific question right now. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, if you get to a point with your project where you're interested in um, giving us a demo of it, we have these calls monthly. So feel free to reach out and we could certainly schedule to do that. Okay. Awesome. Um, cool. If we don't have other specific stuff to talk about, I'm happy to call it a day. Um, let I'm going to leave these notes here for a minute for you to clean up my my butchering, and then I will um, share the notes and video and such with everyone later on. But thanks, thanks for showing up. I hope everybody is healthy and hunkered down as appropriate in their region and uh, staying sane amidst the little chaos and, and unknown here. So it's nice to see you. I do have a, can I ask a couple questions. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Uh, in terms of this meeting, um, like what, what would you say the, so offline collab, um, how does IPFS kind of view that or does it, does it have a team on that or kind of has that, weave into IPFS exactly. So this is the meeting of a significant interest group about that topic. Um, but I think, I think it's people who are coming, some of the people who come to this meeting who are more engaged in like our collaboration space, which includes Lytle and Dietrich, et cetera are the folks within IPFS who can kind of grab the ideas and think about how they apply and how we can improve IPFS for certain use cases. I'm afraid I'm not the best at doing that. Lido, you might be able to give a better, a better answer to the question than I can. Oh, it's a pretty good, pretty good question. Uh, good answer to a pretty good <laughs> question. Everything is great. Um, uh, yeah. The, the, I think the main purpose here is to uh, to like exchange notes. Uh, some people are more technical and have like very low level understanding of IPFS and the P2P stack. Uh, other folks uh, are very like they resonate with uh, needs of people uh, in offline environment or places where the internet connectivity is not that the best. And I feel it's a very good, important to have a place like this to both folks meet uh, and exchange notes, uh, even to uh, exchange links, just to be aware that there's one need and that there is or will be a technical possibility to do something with that. So that would be, that. that's how I understand the purpose of this call. Yeah, and we have, um, so the, the notes that our agenda are in has all of our meeting notes. Um, and we have these recorded calls online. So if anyone is seeing us for the first time on recording this, or Chris, if you haven't caught past 
um, past meetings, you can catch up on those if you want to, to see the kind of variety of topics that we've had. Um, we'll often have a demo of an interesting uh, new app or someone talking about a particular particular use case where they're not using IPFS right now, but um, we've had people chatting about, you know, needs of Native American communities or um, various groups like that. Um, so it's mostly a discussion space, but I certainly hope that it is sparking actionable ideas in some folks and that they'll come back and show us the things that they've made. So. Yeah, you know, I think this is kind of high level brainstormer idea, but you know, uh, for my project, what I start off with is just taking the data and um, kind of converting it in IPLD, IPFS to store it. And then kind of next thing would be like, how do I actually find it? You know, usually you have some kind of database that you can search to find data. And um, that led me to Orbit DB, uh, which kind of has some offline capabilities, it looks like. And some, it's, a, it's a lightweight database. It can only scale so much. But um, the thing that's kind of occurring to me is that it seems like in, it's almost like with immutable data, you kind of, almost everything is offline to begin with because you're going to store it to one node and then, you know, it's immutable, so it's not like someone can change it. So really, it seems like it, it, the whole IPFS world is offline first because there is no central database. There's no central thing to store. And so this kind of has a kind of broad cross-cutting cross um, you know, aspect where it's, kind of, it's, it's inherent in IPFS and immutable storage to begin with. It's the fact that everything kind of begins on one node and then spreads out from there. <laughs> and there is no central thing. Yeah, I should just maybe clarify that the term offline first as coined by the folks at um, Neighborhoody originally, it doesn't mean that, I guess technically all of our data originates offline because we type it somewhere on some device, but um, it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't mean that we first access the thing offline. Like the most common use case is that we have, that we do have a central database, but that we're making the vast functionality, the most important functionality of our app work offline on the individual devices. So in an example like PouchDB and CouchDB, PouchDB is your in-browser database and you can be writing data, writing data, writing data offline. And then once you have a connection, you would sync it to CouchDB in the cloud where you have something central that people are sharing and sync it up again. So that's, it's, there's the bit of a then misnomer there in the first part. I think of it as putting the user experience first by making them have access to what they, the most important stuff offline. Um, there's also a term floating around now called local first, which I take to be a bit more uh, in the specifically decentralized scope. Decentralization is a very, is a small niche portion of the broader offline first audience. So for whatever that's worth. <laughs> right, no, I get it. I think it's, it's interesting to think about, um, you know, I think as this offline space grows, I think, we're, I, I suspect we're likely gonna find ourselves thinking, let's write all of our applications this way, or at least as much as we can as opposed to right now, I think as you start a new web app, you like we have a database, app server, and then you have a front end, and your database is kind of your centralization piece. But I think as we develop more knowledge and success in this offline space, I think it'll shift to be let's do everything we can offline first. And I think, um, like I said, as I came to, I, I was originally planning on using IPFS with some kind of database. And mm -hmm. where I'm at right now is like, is there some way I can use IPFS as the database? If I can, you know use that for everything so it's completely decentralized would completely work offline and you can sync up afterwards it seems like and i don't think it's specific to my use case in fact it's kind of foreign to my use case for the most part but it just seems like a good architectural strategy if you can do it lytle what's your initial response to to someone wanting to use ipfs like a database I feel like there would be like a gut reaction from super IPFS -y people. It's better if you frame it as a key value store when CID <laughs> is key and the value is the data okay. input. 
Okay. Then I'm fine. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I feel it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a database in that sense. Uh, and a lot of people just need a way of putting something and getting like reference to it. Uh, it's effectively glorified uh, key value store for many people who use IPFS in production. And I've seen people simply expose, just like put, uh, put uh, like add and cut or put and get uh, API methods. So as they would expose some endpoint of CouchDB or something like that. Um, I, I just feel it's more it's more that data, database and like framing it with just just putting in that one box uh, uh, sort of like blocks people from uh, leveraging the fact that you don't need to care about date, the way data is moved. Uh, it's super, super important uh, for folks, even like people who care about uh, like Docker images in, in companies where was super painful process of making sure those images are synchronized and available when you need them. And with IPFS, you just refer to that uh, using CID and it's it just fetched from the network. You don't really care from where. Um, similarly, for, with databases, you don't no longer like need to care about like maintenance, uh, like bi-direction, multi-directional synchronization. Uh, I, uh, years back, I worked with uh, CouchDB, uh, and it was like super useful that it had a bidirectional synchronization. In IPFS, you effectively you don't really like you got like just in time synchronization if you want. Uh, you just uh, share those re like references to to the to data. You could share a, a subset of data. So it's like much more, much more flexible than a regular database. That's what, why it's like grabs me, uh, but mostly because it, it may close some, so, some potential use cases if we start talking about IPFS as a database replacement. That's just like my personal pet peeve. Yeah, well, let me clarify. So um, I think IPFS right now is primarily just uh, like for storing files and replicating. I think when you go to something like IPLD, which allows you to build essentially a data model, uh, a content addressable data model, you can actually model a database, um, you know, with it. If you think about a database, you have a bunch of, uh, everything begins with an empty database, and then there's a log of transactions that go against it that are applied. And so if each transaction gets written out to IPFS, it's a separate block. Um, you, you know, you have the same kind of infrastructure available as a database. The biggest issue is how do you kind of find the head <laughs> The head node of what the current state of the database is, um, or the head head node of the transaction log, um, and uh, you know, I think what Orbit DB does use Puff Sub to kind of broadcast it. I mean, IPNS could kind of, but I don't think it's it's probably not designed to be that to be updated that quickly. Um, but the point is, is you can store data and you can get it, and uh, you can uh, build a, a log, a chain of things. It's all intrinsic into IPFS. So yeah, IPFS is not a database, but I'm just saying you could build a database on top of it uh, you know, using IPFS or IPLD as a primitive um, to that. Oh yeah, totally. And so with stuff, like stuff that's built on, to uh, on top of that, you, you, if you like leverage things like CRDTs, you yes. could get that, uh, a conflict resolution without like centralized uh, point of failure, um, which is usually present in most of uh, stacks people have in one form or another. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, you know, you're right. I mean, uh, how many of us have dealt with building highly available solutions at the database level and the application layer? And if you can just you know, it's kind of built into IPFS, I and mean, obviously you could be out of the gate um, if you're not connected. It's kind of where the whole disconnected or offline case comes in. Uh, but start thinking about um, can I go offline first and with your application, it, it can solve a lot of those problems, I think. Yeah, totally. And I feel also like not in like uh, black and white context, uh, even if uh, context where you have some connectivity, 
but you it may be very spotty or you don't have it all the time uh ipfs with stuff like I'm not sure if GraphSync landed, maybe I should not mention it, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but being able to uh, selectively sync just like a subset of a graph uh, that with, with those things that we've just mentioned uh, in IPFS. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I've been looking at a graph sync and I've actually been more engaged in the IPLD community. So I've spun up on the selectors and schemas and um and graph sync so yeah i think there's a lot of a lot of power in there when you start thinking about it as a modeling your your what you normally model a database whether it's mongo or a uh, you know a, a, a document or a database or a sql based database you think about that as an iplb data structure um it i don't know it, it's, it's it's pretty amazing so kind of blowing my mind a little bit about what you can do here at least what you will be able to do in the future as this gets built out Yeah, it's, uh, I always have this feeling that of uh, like, like I, I can see the shape of things to come, but <laughs> it's like all, always so much uh, uh, needs to happen before we are there on usually yes. like lower level, lower levels. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we'll get there eventually. But it's super like like it. Uh, it's always uh, super encouraging to find uh, that people like share that vision. Definitely. Did you like uh, in the context of IP and did I break or was no? You're fine. Go ahead. Terry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, Chris, did you like in the context of IPLD exploration? Did you uh, use your URNs in any context, like for DIDs or no? No. Yeah, we we are like trying to understand potential use cases in like semantic web, like semantic web is one of uh, places where URNs are used. Uh, and we, we probably want to re register IPFS for those like immutable references. And like URIs, URNs, those are uh, the standards that we need to follow if we want to increase adoption. So I was just curious. Um, okay, so well, sorry. Will you just define URI and URN for people who haven't heard them? Uh, yeah, so URIs are universal resource identifiers. Uh, an example of that is URL, which is universal resource location. <laughs> so uh, URLs uh, are a subset of URIs. And it's basically a way of addressing things, a formalized way of addressing things. And URNs are used in context where um, like location do not matter. Um, What's the N stand for? Uh, notation, I believe. One second, I, I had it open. Uh, let me quickly share my screen because um, I got the examples. Yeah, so like uh, it's a UE4 resource name. I lied before, <laughs> but it's a like uniform resource name, a uniform resource identifier uh, has ISBN number, right? So if you want to refer to some like name. Assuming there's like a namespace of identifiers and you want to address that, uh, you need a way of addressing different namespaces in like a uniform way. Uh, so that's why it, it has like uniform <laughs> in its name. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, books, uh, RFCs uh, and other, other stuff. Uh, we pro probably, if people want to, let's say there's a scientific paper and someone uh, wants to attach or like refer to a data set or the tools they used for creating that paper or doing the research. Uh, if they use content addressing, that's pretty useful, but often uh, there's a certain level of formalization needed. Uh, 
depending on the context. Some like uh, semantic web uh, projects uh, require, they simply standardize on your, using URNs everywhere. So that way they can use all the sub namespaces in the URN uh, and be more uh, con uh, confident about what they are parsing if uh, they let like user to enter the, the identifier. It's basically like a formal, formalized way of addressing stuff without providing location. Um, in web browsers, you don't see your URNs, but you may see them in like more spe specialized applications uh, and contexts. So that's like when I hear uh, IPLD and, and people trying to build like data structures, I've seen often people experimenting with DIDs. And in DIDs, I believe they uh, either have a DID protocol scheme or they use URNs. Um, That's about it. I was just like curious. Well, the, you know, I have not heard of either of those. I've only been going to the team meetings now for about a month. Um, the only, one thing that did come up at this week's team meeting, I'll put the notes, links to it here, uh, Volker VMX, um, something he, some kind of open OGC, what is this? this is open geospatial, some kind of mapping thing. They're about to redo yep. their standard. And he wants to get uh, CIDs or have it work with um, IPFS, and so that may be a good, you know, using URNs and standardizing CIDs. That's one thing that did come up this week that is related to what you're talking about. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good, uh, very good example of uh, of that. Uh, yeah. So. Yep. Right is, there. Yep. Yeah. He's like, yeah, they're only updated every 15 years, and so now he wants to try and squeak it in somehow so it will work with IPLD directly. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, and that, that's uh, sort of like why it's important. Uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, time, like those standards either exist for decades or once something is standardized, uh, it will be present for decades. So it's important to make it easier for people to use IPFS uh, in those contexts, yeah. Super cool, I need to talk with Volker about this. <laughs> I'm just looking at the calendar here for April. It looks like April 15th, we're scheduled for our next call. And I think we're good to not have it conflict with the GUI. <coughs> yep, we're good. Cool. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, as always, happy to continue any chats in the repo if you want to. And I will, um, once I get these notes, added and the video up, I will respond to, there's an issue for the call itself. So feel free to subscribe to that if you wanna make sure you get updates on upcoming calls. Um, I'll just paste the, since you heard about this elsewhere, let me paste that there for you, Chris. Um, but that's where you'll see updates about this call. Um, and that's the repo we use. So if you wanna start a discussion about anything, feel free to do so in an issue there. Um, yeah, great to see everyone, and we will see you on April 15th. If you have uh, discussion ideas, demo ideas, someone you think should be speaking on the call, certainly let us know in that thread and we can get someone scheduled. All right, stay safe, everybody. Have a great month until we see you again. Bye. Bye.